Okay, so let's start the real technical discussions. And uh, this is the first memory technology we are going to discuss. This is for the SRAM. And as you know, SRAM is uh, for the cache. So then the outline for the SRAM lecture includes the basic SRAM operation, six transistor, or we call 6T cell. And we are going to discuss that today. And then next, we are going to discuss the SRAM stability, like the noise margin from the static or the dynamic analysis point of view. And then we are going to discuss the SRAM layout. And you will see how we get that 150 F square by looking at the layout. And then we'll discuss the scanning trend and the variability uh, for the SRAM design, and then some soft error. And also, the last topic will be the thin fat. S -run. Okay, first of all, S run is short for static random access memory. So here static means there's no periodic refresh. This is respect to the D run, which will require the full refresh. So S run static means you don't need to refresh. Random access means each cell or each bit of the memory array can be accessed. Access means read or write independently. So this is respect to the NAND flash we are going to talk about later. For the NAND flash, it's not random access. So when you write, you have to write the whole block. So then this is different. And uh, S1 is volatile. So this is a volatile memory. When you remove the power supply, then the memory state is lost. <coughs> So this are the concepts for the S1. And uh, here is the evolution for the S1 in the past uh, several decades. Back in 1980s, so the L1 cache, the S1, is actually off chip of the processor. And the trend is to integrate the cache on chip, on the same chip of the processor. So that, that's why you have L1 cache on chip and then you have L2 cache on chip, and eventually today, typically we have three level cache on chip. So the typical size, for example here, L1 at 256 kilobytes, L2 one megabyte, L3 eight megabytes. So this is a typical capacity for the three level cache in a typical processor. Of course, for servers, you may have seen larger L3 cache even up to 20 megabytes. But this is for a typical processor. And then let's look at the each individual S1 cell. So the S1 cell is normally six transistor, and we call it 6T cell. And this is uh, the structure of the cell. And we have the word line for the row and the bit line for the colon. And for S RAM, we have two bit lines. So one is bit line, one is bit line bar. So those are for complementary signal processing. And in the middle, we have two inverters cross coupled. And we have this inverter one and inverter two. And then we have two pass gates to connect the bit line to the N1 and N2 load. So this N1 and N2 load are important because those are the storage load we store the data in the N1 or N2. And if you draw this out into the transistor level, this is how it looks like in the S1 cell. So we have six transistors here, and uh, four NMOS, P, two PMOS. So here, the bottom, we have the pull-down transistor. So we call it PD. And those pull-down transistor, NMOS, and then we have this <coughs> cascade transistor, also NMOS. Only PMOS is the pull up. And this is the structure of the 6T S1 cell. Any questions? And then Let's look at how the operation is performed in this S-RAN cell. 
So that three operations, hold, read, or write. Hold means you don't do read or write. You hold the data there. You do nothing. Okay. If you want to hold the data there, then what kind of voltage you need to apply to the VLAN bitnet? So here it says zero to the VLAN. Because if you have zero to the VLAN, those two pass gates, a MOS transistor, those are off, right? So those transistors are off. Then in the middle, you have this cross-coupled inverter. You know it's a latch, and then you can latch the data like that. You have two stable states. Let's say the, if N1 stores 0, N2 will store 1. Or if N1 stores 1, N2 will store 0. So this is always complementary. And your real data, for example, you, you, you have defined a reference. You always read from, let's say, bit 9 from here. Then your N1 is the data you store. So you look at the N1's voltage is VDD or ground. If N1 is VDD, then it stores 1. If N1 is ground, then you store 0. Because otherwise, it's always complementary. So this is uh, the whole operation. Basically, you turn off the VLAN, and the pass gates are off. Then the memory cell in the middle is isolated with the outside bit lines. So you can hold your data there. Of course, as long as you have the power supply VDD there, once you remove that, then the data is gone. So this is volatile memory. And then if you want to read, then what do you do? Any idea? If you want to read, then you turn on the word line. So you need to turn on the word line. Then the question is, uh, bit line, bit line bar, what kind of voltage you need to apply? Any idea? So here, before you turn on the word line, actually you want to pre-charge bit line, bit line bar to be both VDD, to be one. So here, for example, you charge both of them to be one. And you look at this. Now you turn on the word line, so this becomes one. The pass gate is turned on. And then you look at the N1 node. It stores, stores zero. That means this is ground. So this is one. That means this is VDD. You will have current flow this way. So this current will flow through the pass gate PG1. And this current will discharge the bit line from VDD to some lower value. So then this VDD will minus some delta V. That is the change of the voltage. On the right hand side, this N2 load. So here is one VDD, and bit line bar is VDD, and then there are equal potential source and drain. So there's no current flow. So that means nothing will happen. So then bit line bar will be kept at VDD, and bit line will become VDD minus delta V. And then later, at the edge of the array, we have this sense amplifier. We're going to discuss that in more details later. So this sense amplifier basically is a differential amplifier to sense the small difference. And it will sense that the bit line has a smaller voltage than the bit line bar. And the output will say that bit line is 0 and bit line bar is 1. So this is the principle of the read. Is there a reason that we charge it rather than pre-discharging it? I mean, if we say we made both of them 0, mm -hmm. so just that pre-charging is the faster of the two, which results in a faster say, sense amplifier function Mm-hmm, that's a good point. Uh, ideally, this should be equivalent, I think. Maybe from the practical circuit example, mobile pre-charge is better. But uh, in principle, they are similar. But it's 
uh, and in, in the industry is always prejudiced to VDD. Sorry, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the whole one zero and uh, zero and one, they, they need to be zero and one all one and zero. Can can it be the zero and zero? Or no, always complementary. So it can be, be it, it can be the one and zero. Right? Yeah, can be this one and zero. Example. Yeah, this is just an example. You're yeah, right. So always complementary. Any other question? Okay, then write operation. Now you want to change the data. So previously n one stores zero, and now you want to change that zero to one. That means the n2 will change from 1 to 0 because as we discussed, always complementary. If you change one, the other one will also change. So if you want to do that, then how, how do you apply the voltage? Again, you have to turn on the word line because if you turn off the word line, then this is isolated from the outside. If you want to talk to the outside, that means read or write from the outside. Then you need to turn on the word line. Now you need to prepare the data, like VDD or ground, to your bit or bit bar, depending on what data you are going to write. In this particular example, you want to write N1 to be 1. So you need to prepare VDD to the bit line. And you want to write N2 to be 0. Then you need to provide ground 0 to the bit line bar. So then, we are going to discuss in more details how this actually happens. But if you do that, basically you are going to drive in this data from the outside to the N1, N2 node. Then N1 will become the same as this VDD, N2 will become the same as the zero. We are going to discuss the details process later. But in principle, you have to prepare the data pattern you want to write from the bit line or bit line bar. So any questions here? Okay, so this is the operation of the write. And uh, let's look at more details of the stability. So here this is hold operation, as we discussed. You apply zero to the word line, and those two pass gates are off. So in the middle, you have this cross-coupled inverter. And the cross-coupled inverter will have this kind of a butterfly curve. We call it butterfly curve. So essentially, if you look at each individual transistor, oh sorry, individual inverter, you have this VTC curve. This is the voltage transfer curve for the individual uh, inverter. So let's look at this graph. So this two inverter, let's say N1 and N2 voltage. So here are the voltage of N2 and voltage as for the N1. So if you look at the inverter 2, this inverter. So the input is N1, output is N2. So that means you will have this blue curve. This is the blue curve. Is the VTC for the inverter 2. So you know for the inverter, if you sweep the input N1 voltage from 0, to VDD, then the output voltage N2 will reduce from VDD to ground following this blue curve. So this is for the inverter 2. And similarly, for the inverter 1, you exchange the input and output. Now for the inverter 1, the N2 becomes input and N1 becomes output. So in the same plot, you just uh, flip it like this. So then you are going to have the red curve for the VTC of inverter 1. So this is like a butterfly, and we call it butterfly curve. So in this curve, we have three intersections between the two curves. And uh, those two green ones, we call it stable points. So this correspond to, for example, here, if the circuit is in this state, that means the VN1 N1 is 0, and N2 is 1. 
if in the other stable point, that means n1 is 1, n2 is 0. So those are the two stable points. That's the data you stored there. And uh, in the middle, we have this meta-stable point. And we will see why this is the meta-stable data. But this is the butterfly curve, which is very important. And you will have homework on this. So with this butterfly curve, we can understand why this S1 cell can tolerate the lowest if this relates to the lowest margin. So you can use this uh, butterfly curve to understand this. For example, if we assume initially n1 stores 0, n2 stores 1, okay, and then somehow we have some noise to make the n1 becomes some positive delta v here. We have some noise, positive, vol positive voltage on the n1 node. That means this n1 voltage, if you look at this curve, then n1 voltage will increase from zero to this delta v value. So that means here in this circuitry, you see the voltage increase of n1. So you can use this butterfly curve to look at the traces of the uh, voltage of n1, n2. So here, firstly, input to the inverter 2 is n1. If n1 changes from here, according to the blue curve, then the n2 voltage will, you look at here, so you look at the blue curve, and then you will see that n2 voltage will decrease to here. So that means if you have noise to n1, the n2 will decrease from VDD to some value here. Now this uh, N2 voltage will become input to the inverter 1. So that means you are going to use the red curve to look at what will happen in the next. So if V2 reduces to here, according to this red curve, then you, you look at the N1 will go back to here. So the noise makes the N1 to here, but after this one loop, then the N1 reduces to here. Now you can continue another loop, right? you can use this as input to the inverter 2 and look at the blue curve to find what is the N2 voltage. N2 voltage will become this one. And then after a couple of iterations like this, Eventually, you will see that the circuits go back to this point. That means N1 reduced to zero and N2 restored to VDD. So that's your original state. You can go through these iterations by yourself. So this is due to the positive feedback in this couple uh, inverters. You have this kind of positive feedback to restore the signal as long as your noise is uh, within some certain range, that is the noise margin you can tolerate. And then we can also look at the metastable points. If initially the circuit is biased to this point, and if it's symmetric, then this will be half VDD. So if initially N1, both N1 and N2 are in this node, then any noise, let's say, if you have noise to make the N1 a little bit smaller than the metastable voltage, then you can go through the iterations. I will skip that, you can do it by yourself. But the conclusion is that eventually the circuitry stable point will become this, this one. So that means any voltage that disturb the metastable point to either direction will make the circuitry go to either one of those real stable points. So that's why in the real circuit you will not have the metastable points because you always have the 
noise. So there are only two stable points in this circuit. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So we still have a few minutes. Let's let's look at the read operation. So in the read operation, let's look at more details here. In the read operation, as we discussed, we need to precharge both bit line and bit line bar to be VDD and then we turn on the overlap. So let's assume N1 stores 0 and N2 stores 1. This is just an example. Of, of course, you can reverse that. But let's assume that first. So in this case, <coughs> the VDD here, and then you look at the circuits here. Pass gate is turned on, and then this is the 0. So you have current flow through this pass gate. And this current need to be synced to the ground. So that means this PD1 needs to be turned on as well. This is PD1 is turned on because N2 is one VDD. This is a VGS for the PD1. So this PD1 is also on. So this current will flow from the bitland to the ground through PG1 and PD1. So this is a red current. And this current is going to discharge the bitman because the bitman will have some parasitic capacitance because of wires you know wire bitman to bitman you have the parasitic capacitance because between two metal wires you have the insulators and it's like two metal plates with dielectric in between so it, it's a cap so you're going to discharge this bitman cap by this current so initially the bitman voltage is VDD and then Due to this discharging, then bitman voltage will drop by this delta V. On the other side, this bitman bar, as we discussed, this is VDD and this is VDD, so nothing will happen. There's no current flow. So then nothing is happened, then the bitman bar voltage will maintain at VDD. So essentially, this one will become VDD minus delta V. And then the bit and will bit and bar will be still at VDD. And as we discussed, the sense amp will sense this small voltage difference. So this is the, the read operation. But we want to look at in more details of this read operation. So here when you do the read operation, one thing you need to notice that is this N1 voltage will increase from within uh, from ground. Because you have current flow through those two transistors. So that means this voltage is uh, larger than the ground. So you can think that those two transistors, if you think those two transistors are like two resistors, so essentially it's a voltage divider. You have current flow from the bit line to the ground, and in the middle point, this is your N1 node, this is the voltage divider. So this N1 node voltage is larger than ground. However, in the read operation, your goal is to read out the data your goal is not to disturb the data. That means after read operation, you still want N1 node to be zero. You don't want to change that. You just want to read out. So that set a constraint here, because N1 node is increasing. The voltage is increasing. So you want that increase to be small, as small as possible. So that means you want to design this two transistor size carefully to make the increase of the N1 voltage to be small. So in that sense, if you do this kind of voltage divider concept, so let's say the pass gate and the pull down, you want the resistance of the pull down to be small than the resistance of the pass gate to make that N1 node voltage small. This is uh, the requirement. So if you look at the timing diagram here, when you turn on the word line, the N1 node will increase a little bit. And at the same time, the N2 node may decrease a little bit. 
but you don't want them to cross over because that means you disturb the data. You want N1 node to impress a little bit, but that's it. If you want, make, you want to make this happen, you have to make sure the pull down transistor resistance to be small. Because this small resistance will make this node close to the ground in this multi divider. So I think we are going to discuss this in the next lecture how to make this happen. Make sure that the N1 node will be small, close to the ground. So I think that's the end of today's lecture.